This is the FutureX Podcast. In each episode, we interview a platform designer, author, or publisher. They'll talk about how to build online communities that are diverse, welcoming, and safe. Now, here's your host, Lee Schneider. Welcome to FutureX. I'm Lee Schneider. In today's episode, you'll meet J.J. Ramberg, co-creator of Good Pods. J.J. is a tech entrepreneur who has been named one of Inc. Magazine's Female Founders 100. She was the host of MSNBC's Your Business for more than a decade. She has an MBA from Stanford and is the mother of three. I could go on for a while, but you get the idea that J.J. is a super accomplished person. She started Good Pods with her brother Ken as a way for podcast listeners to share what they're listening to with their friends and also recommend episodes. For the podcaster, Goodreads is a way to interact with your audience and get your podcast discovered. It answers the question, what should I listen to next? JJ, welcome to the show. Oh, Lee, thank you so much. I'm so happy to talk to you. Now, Good Pods, social media, discovery platform, what is it? How do you describe it? Um, you know, the easiest way to describe it, frankly, is a reference, which is it's the Goodreads of podcasting for people who are familiar with Goodreads, right? Or Twitter or Instagram, et cetera, of podcasting. What we are trying to do is solve the discovery problem in podcasting. Other people have gotten the technical stuff down, right? There are other people making amazing content. But the big problem in podcasting is that there is so much great content, but you don't know how to find it. And that's where Good Pods comes in. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Why is it hard to find podcasts? Shouldn't it be easier? Why is that so important when you're doing a podcast? Well, it should be easy, right? But it's like like so many things. You're overwhelmed by choice. There are millions of podcasts out there, and, you know, even many more millions of episodes. And what happens to people a lot is they're going out for a run. I mean, I'll tell you my story, right? I'm going out for a run. I want to listen to something. I'm like, oh, what do I listen to? Right? So in the old days, before Good Pods, I would call my brother or text my sister or my best friend and say, like, what should I listen to right now? It's incredibly inefficient. <laughs> right? You just want good suggestions from friends. And that really was the problem in podcasting is you don't have a good place to get good suggestions. And that's how people like to find things. And so the way Good Pods works, if you want me to go into it, but it's, it's basically, you know, it's a player. You can listen to something and it goes to the feed. So instead of calling me, Lee, and saying, hey, JJ, what are you listening to? You can just go onto your Good Pods feed and see all of the things that your friends are listening to. Right. Now, for the listener, that makes sense. For the podcaster, you've spoken a bit about surfacing podcasts that we might not normally find. And that could include podcasts from marginalized groups, people of color, women, all kinds of groups that may not pop up in our feed automatically. So is there anything that Good Pods is doing specifically to help? Well, when you think about what podcasts are promoted out there, right, they are often the ones that organizations have spent millions and millions of dollars to buy, right? And so they need to recoup their their investment on those podcasts. So what happens to the person who is making a brilliant podcast, but doesn't have this machine behind them marketing the podcast, right? Or doesn't have super deep pockets to market? Well, that podcast can get lost even though the content is amazing. But here's what happens. You, Lee, might have heard about this podcast from somewhere, right? And you listen to it. Then on Good Pods, I see it. And then I listen to it. And then my friends see it, et cetera. So really what we're doing on Good Pods is amplifying word of mouth podcasting. And frankly, that's the way people want to learn about podcasts anyhow. Now, what about the audience of producers that you're trying to connect with? I know from my experience, even doing this podcast, that I've had to work a little bit harder to get out of my own bubble and find people who are different than I am and have different points of view, uh, come from different worlds. Have you approached it like that at all? 
I have. Look, if so on Good Pods, uh, again, it's a player. You can listen to podcasts on there. But the really fun part, at least for me um, as a user, is the feed. And you have two separate feeds. So one is your feed of everyone you're following. So those are all your friends, influencers, or influencers you like, et cetera. Then we have the everyone feed. And I often spend time scrolling through the everyone feed because that's where I find A, new people to follow, but B, that's where I get out of my bubble, right? And so I see what everyone's listening to. And if you look on the Good Pods feed, you're not going to just see all the top podcasts, right? You see a lot of really interesting podcasts that you would have never discovered before. And what's cool about it for me is that it's by episode, so someone's not just saying, oh, hey, go listen to the Future X podcast. You're saying, oh, I listened to this particular episode. And so I at least know where to start. And have you found yourself reaching out to particular producers to try to feature the podcast? Or do you kind of let the app do its thing? Both. Both. Uh, we we have places where we um, have, for example, it's Good Pods Recommends or Good Pods Team Picks or mm -hmm. Featured List. Those are editorial from Good Pods. We also have algorithmic suggestions. You liked X, you'll also like this. So we have all of that. Um, and we reach out to people. People reach out to us a lot. To me personally, that's not quite as fun as the recommendations from friends, but it is if you, if you like those kinds as well. Um, but we've done all kinds of things with producers and podcast hosts, et cetera. For instance, we recently did a Dungeons and Dragons um, and, and tabletop role-playing games takeover of Good Pods, those podcasts. Mm -hmm. And that was really generated from that community, right? So the TTRPG and D&D community came together, they created a whole Discord server around let's take over Good Pods. And so I had, you know, in that particular case, a lot of communication with people in that podcast world because they they saw this as an opportunity to, hey, let's take over the feed. We'll get all of our listeners on board on Good Pods to listen to our shows and then they'll discover all of our podcasts on the feed. Now, D and D, it's a name. We're so at least I know that name, and this is bridging to the idea of influencers. Are influencers mm -hmm. still a good play for a podcaster or platform builder trying to get attention? I think they are when they influence the right thing, right? I mean, I have to say, if you just think about it for yourself, and I look at my behavior on Good Pods. The biggest influencer for me are my friends, right? Because this is unlike me um, spending a tiny bit of money buying, you know, a cheap product or, you know, spending 20 seconds watching a TikTok video or something, right? If I am going to go give 20, 45, an hour and a half, two hours of my time, who am I going to listen to? It's got to be suggested by somebody who I really trust for this particular kind of thing. And I might not, you know, the influencer to get me by my, you know, new skin cream is not necessarily the same person who's going to get me to listen to a podcast for two hours or even 20 minutes. And so that's why we really think of Good Pods as friends are influencers. This is word of mouth. And sure, if you get somebody who a lot of people are listening to and they have a really big audience, then yes, they're always important too. Um, but you have to remember, listening to a podcast is a big commitment. And, and, and so right. we kind of think of people as podcast influencers, which is different than any other kind of influencer. Yeah, that's a great point. Very true. It's a bigger commitment. If we're thinking about the platform itself, we can dialogue on that platform. We can give comments on that platform. A lot of people in my recent readings about trying to figure out what makes a good platform, content moderation comes into it as a big factor because platforms are content moderation in some way. Uh, they have to work, but they are content moderation vehicles. Have you had to do a lot with content moderation or is it kind of working itself out on its own? You know, there's some content moderation on the site, but as with other social media, right, people 
go on there to engage with each other. What's interesting about Good Pods is unlike some other social media, which is sort of thrives on emotions of, you know, it, it might be FOMO or envy or <laughs> things like that. We think of Good Pods as really the way to share things that are good for you, right? Or entertaining or help expand your brain or your mind or make you see things in a different way. Um, and so some of what's amazing is seeing the podcasters engage with their audience um, or the podcasters engage with each other. But it's, it is really um, the, the, the sort of user generated content on Good Pods is really, I, I use the term optimistic, right? Mm. In mm -hmm. that it is a lot of people sharing things like, I want to learn this. I want to laugh about this, et cetera. It's interesting because there's an interview that I've done for this series that uh, I don't know where it will be, uh, whether it has already aired or after, but with the one of the fellows who created Literal.club, which is kind of like a Good Pods for books. It's kind of like a remix of Goodreads. And I asked him the same question, and he had a similar answer Due to the type of community that we're talking about here, in that case, book readers and book appreciators, mm -hmm. and in your case, podcast folk, there's not a lot of negative attack stuff happening. And I'm trying to understand, what's the secret sauce there? Like, you take a, a platform like Reddit or a platform like Twitter, and they're basically built to make you mad. The, a lot of the posts that get surface on those are the popular posts are the shouting, the all caps kind of things, or a very strong opinion. And even on a, a platform like, you know, literal.club, which is a book platform, there's not a lot of all caps going on there. And there's, no, there's strong opinions, but there's not a lot of attack stuff happening. And it's similar with, with your platform. And I'm wondering... Is it the kind of person that we're attracting there or is it just the nature of the medium? Because it seems very different to me. I think it's the, I mean, maybe it's both, right? Uh, but, but we have seen that people are on here because they want to share, they want to share ideas of what they've listened to. This is, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a, a place where I'm sharing my opinion opinion about things hmm. even though obviously people do share their opinions this was an amazing podcast i learned so much whatever it is you're or like can you believe this happened in the show it's it's sharing it's sharing content which is um a, a little bit different um mm -hmm. yeah there's sort of an i want to say there's kind of an intellectual ism to it but but that's not the right word because obviously sometimes you're sharing like you know a totally silly comedy podcast or you know, kind of a self-helpy thing, but it is, I, I keep coming up with the word optimistic, but it's like they're explorers. People mm, who are in good pods are explorers, mm -hmm. I think, right? Explorers of, of, it's a way to like visit different worlds through podcasts. When you think about why people listen to podcasts and the vast majority, you know, wide variety of things you listen to, it's, I want to dip into comedy. I want to learn something about history. I want to do politics right now for a second, but you know, politics isn't the number one thing on good pods by any means. It's, right. it's, it's not all fiery, right? It's a lot of just fun stuff to think about and discover, et cetera. Yeah. And that way it's very similar to the early days of the internet and a little bit like what Mastodon is now. We're appreciating these things. I want to share this with you. That spirit of kind of mm -hmm. let's, let's share this thing. I think that is exactly the way to say it is people come and use good pods in appreciation mode and they use it because look, I am, it is, it is, it has started like the genesis of this was through friends. Hmm. I am listening to a podcast and I want you to listen to it because it's so good or because I learned something of it um, from it. Or I am going out for a run, hopping in my car. I want to find something to listen to. I'm not coming to Good Pods to get all fired up about something and angry, right? <laughs> I'm coming to Good Pods because I'm about to go on a road trip and I've got 10 hours and I want to either be entertained or learn something or be inspired, et cetera. And I'm getting that from other people who I'm following on, on the app. Now, let's change the perspective a little bit and talk about building a platform. 
And if you were giving any advice to someone who was trying to build a platform out of their passions, out of a recommendation engine, out of a kind of a culture space, what would you tell them? What's your best piece of advice? Um, it's hard. <laughs> It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of um, this works, this does it. You have to be open-minded. You have to really, really, really talk to the people who are using the platform. I mean, one of the reasons why Good Pods grew is because early on, we started a dialogue um, with all size podcasters, big and small, um, and listeners. I mean, Lee... You were one of the early people that I spoke to in Good Pods, right? That's true. And people like you were just incredibly helpful for me to say, okay, here's my hypothesis. I have a feeling that discovery is stopping people from listening and discovery is stopping podcasters from growing their audiences. And if that's true, tell me your experience with that. And so we listened to, I spoke to 700, I'm not kidding, 700 people wow. before we launched this thing. <laughs> Wow. Um, and then launched it and then continued that dialogue to say, okay, what on this works? What on, doesn't work? And, you know, we get suggestions all the time. And then we have to say, let's prioritize these, which is hard because you want to do everything all at once. But obviously, we don't have unlimited capacity to do all of that. So so really, it is it is understanding that you're not going to get it right the first time. You're not going to get it right the hundredth time. You're never going to get it right. You're constantly going to be changing. Yeah, and I found also in building audiences for podcasts and platforms, you don't always know what's going to click. When you do a podcast and you have Brené Brown as your first interview, you can be pretty sure you're going to get a lot of downloads on that podcast. That's great. But in my case, I've cast actors in podcasts, hoping that they would be promoters of their role in the podcast. Mm -hmm. And when they do, it's magic. You know, when they are all over every platform that they use telling people about their appearance in the podcast or, how, you know, what it was like for them, the people who do that, those podcasts are still racking up numbers you know, in, in the thousands mm -hmm. versus the podcast that I thought was fascinating, but only reached a few people and didn't get kind of that kind of synergistic, connective promotion. And I think so much of this is that soft, you know, the person who tells the person who tells the person kind of networking that makes these things work. Well, that's, that is exactly the issue we're trying to solve for. So if you think about you have one show and a thousand people listen to it, I'm just picking a number right from you, a thousand people listen to it and it's on good pods. Unlike if somebody listens to it on another player where that listen goes into never, never land on good pods, that means it is hitting the feed a thousand times, mm -hmm. right? That means it is being marketed over and over again and on the everyone feed and also on people's friends feed. And so none of those listens go to waste. All of those listens become a piece of marketing so that then people see it, they'll listen to that one, then their friends see it, right? Or someone's like, oh, I love this one. Click, let me go see what else is on this, you know, what, what other episodes are on this show. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to harness the excitement that you might get around a couple of episodes and use that to grow your audience for all of the rest of your episodes. And it's the reminder factor. You know, I, I'll put a tab up in my browser and try to ignore it. And then it keeps coming up and I keep seeing, well, I'm supposed to be doing that thing or I'm supposed to be going to that thing. And eventually I do it because it's there in front of me. And I think we're so distracted these days. There's so much going on, right? You need that kind of click, that reminder. I think there's also something really fun well, there are two things. One, yes, you need the reminder. But two, it is hard to remember. We, mm. we, our brains are filled with so many things that someone might say to me, oh, my God, I just listened to the most amazing Future X um, podcast episode, or I might see it on Twitter or something. But when I'm about to go for my run or get in my car, I'm like, wait, what did they tell me to listen to again? Shoot, mm. can't remember. Okay, go back to the normal ones I always listen to, even though I would love to. I just forget or I can't find it. I forget the name. Right now I can just go on, oh, let me go onto Lee's profile and see what he listened to. 
The other fun thing, and this is just sort of like an interesting psychological experiment, right? But it, it makes sense. The other fun thing, so that I the the use cases as a user is either I see you, Lee, listen to something and I listen to it, right? Or I listen to something and then I see you, Lee, listen to it later on. And there is something really fun about knowing that I listen to something and then a friend of mine listened to it because they liked my recommendation. And so, right, I get a notification. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are all sorts of privacy settings, so you can decide what you want. Mm -hmm. I can make my listens public, private, et cetera. Notifications are not. But the way I have mine set up, I get a notification saying, hey, Lee, just listen to the podcast you listen to. And then it's so fun to know that sort of you took my recommendation, but then also to know like, oh, I can talk to you about it now. I'm so excited about this thing mm. I just heard, and now I know Lee heard it too. Let's switch gears for a moment and talk about New Atlantis Labs, a project you started on Discord. So New Atlantis Labs is a new company that is kind of at a very top level um, addressing the twin challenges of climate change and biodiversity. And we do it by aligning community, government, industry, and individual benefit with the improving ecological health of our oceans, which um, I know is a lot to throw at you. Um, <laughs> but the idea ultimately is to create the, the scientific, the data, and the economic frameworks needed to create a sustaining funding model for ocean conservation. But to get to your question about why do it on Discord, the way New Atlantis Labs is is being built is really in an open community because protecting our oceans is an enormous, enormous issue and really focus on the biodiversity in our oceans is, is an enormous issue. And if we want to tackle this issue as quickly as it needs to be tackled, because we are truly talking about sort of the health of our planet, right? And the survival of human beings, species, et cetera, on our planet if we want to tackle this as quickly as we need to, we need to get as many brains and as, as much enthusiasm mm -hmm. and as much excitement as possible on this issue. And Discord is a really amazing platform to bring people in and have conversations and really meld ideas and get ideas and be inspired by each other. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to me. It sounds like the kind of idea you could have done a, a series of webinars, you could have done some in-person events, there are many choices, but the specific open-ended, asynchronous, continual information stream of a Discord is an unusual way of going about it, but I imagine a very open-ended way, which suits your purposes. Well, it's an ongoing discussion, right? Because we are trying to, again, solve these big issues. And the idea behind the way we are doing this is really to open it up to scientists from all around the world who have ideas about how to do this, right? Whether those are data scientists or marine scientists, open it up to, that. that's on the science side, but really open it up to people who care about this issue, who have lots of ideas. I mean, one of one of the big problems we've had in science traditionally is that things are siloed. And so if we can create a world where things are not siloed, where there is a true exchange of ideas, that is what we are trying to create here because that's how we're going to solve issues much more efficiently, much more quickly than we have in the past. Well, that makes the choice of discord really clear and really powerful. It's really amazing, right? Because you have people coming at this from all different angles, asking questions. I mean, one of one of the one of the amazing things I found about um, how we are building this community it is it's very open. It's very again. I'm going to use the word optimistic for New Atlantis Labs. It's very optimistic, and it's people who care so deeply. And so mm -hmm. everyone is really open to the questions that are being asked and really open to the community's answers to the questions. Most of these questions don't have answers yet, right? But we right. really need to work through them as a group because everyone's an expert in something else. And if you can find a way to bring together all of that expertise, it is much better than saying, hey, we in this room here have all the answers. We're not listening to any of you. 
Why are you the person to be sitting here in the podcast chair right now to talk about New Atlantis Labs? <laughs> well, it's not just me. It could be an entire team of people, right? We have um, the two founders, Courtney Nichols Gould and Gordon Gould, are these incredible entrepreneurs, very successful with um, previous company that they had launched and in, in which was acquired Smarty Pants. And we have an incredible team of marine scientists and data scientists um, from all over. And so, but why I got involved is is really um, from a couple of different directions, but it, but it comes down to understanding that if we do not address the issues of our environment and from our angle, biodiversity and how incredibly important that is for the health of our planet, then it's going to be a big problem. I mean, to say the least, right? So it, it is really a matter of life and death. It is really a matter of can we save this planet, right? We only have one home right now. As much as we're trying to find the other ones right now, this is the home that we are living on. And if we do not address how we treat our environment, nature, then this home is going to disappear. And that sounds so big and alarmist, et cetera, but it is the truth. And we at New Atlantis are very optimistic about being able to solve these issues very optimistic, particularly because of all of the amazing people that we're working with. Um, but I'm involved in this because I care. I care about, I care about putting all of my work into, you know, I've had all these years of, of experience and really wanting to take all that experience and putting it towards something that truly matters. And there's a time limit for this. And so we need to be working on this now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I can bring out my dad credentials here and my parent credentials because what motivates me to even talk about these things is children, having children and knowing what kind of world that I'm leaving for them and we as our generation and your younger generation leaving for them and realizing that, you know, we've kind of screwed this up and there's got to be some solution and putting the best minds together is one plan. Having a, a brain trust, as it were, is one great way. Abolishing fossil fuel companies is another great way. But not everybody's going to be ready for everything, and not everybody's going to be ready for every step. So the idea of starting this dialogue sounds very positive to me. Well, what's incredible is people are very familiar with climate change, right? Yeah. That is that very luckily and happily, that has really become part of the conversation. What has not yet become as large a part of the conversation is biodiversity loss and mm -hmm. how incredibly important it is for us to change the trajectory of biodiversity loss because our earth and our nature is such a complex web and everything <laughs> plays a role and we can't have things disappear or else that role will no longer be played. And the ocean is such a mystery to people. My kids are surfers. I spend a ton of time in the ocean. And so we think of it as this kind of big playground without thinking so often about the role that the ocean plays. So if I can just throw a couple of things out at you, or you can tell me to stop if you don't want to go do into this, but <laughs> you know, uh, almost every second breath we take comes from the ocean, right? And that whole process comes from a whole intricate, complex web of organisms under the ocean that are creating oxygen, right? Photosynthesis, et cetera. But so much food we have comes from the ocean. We're looking in the ocean for materials that are used in medicines. And when we're just out there surfing or on the beach, we don't think about all of that stuff of what is happening under, under mm. the water there that, that we on our team and our team of scientists, et cetera, are really understanding so that we can get a true sense of the health of our ocean. I think a really great value here is getting people more appreciative and caring about nature. We tend to, especially in Southern California, kind of take it for granted uh, until the skies are filled with smoke and we can't go outside and we can't open the windows or the water is too polluted, you can't go in. Then we start to think about it. But to get people thinking about it more, it seems to be of great value. Well, the problem, one of the problems is we never put a price on nature, right? The, the example we like to use a lot is you could go back your truck up 
to a river, fill it, fill up a bunch of plastic bottles with water and go sell that water for whatever you're going to sell it for, $3 a bottle, whatever it is, right? We have put a price on the truck. We've put a price on the gas. We put a price on the bottles. We put a price on the shipping. We put a price on all of that. We did not put a price on going in and taking that water and the ecosystems that it destroyed. So, hey, suddenly you might have destroyed an entire ecosystem that played an incredibly important role in nature and for humanity, right? So when we're going in there and we're chopping up mangroves, you're, you're, it's, it costs something because suddenly, uh, amongst the many things that mangroves do, you've just ruined the coastal protection. So now the little city or village, et cetera, on the other side of that might be destroyed in the next hurricane. But nobody priced that in. Mm -hmm. So I think as we start to truly understand the role that nature plays and the actual price of destroying it, then it's going to be made, you know, even it's going to be easier for people to understand why this matters. What? do you think we should leave people with when they're thinking about the New Atlantis project? I want people to think about the price of doing things, right? Think about what do you need in life and, and is it worth the cost of whatever it is I'm doing, right? Think about how going in and destroying nature, going in and trawling, right? <laughs> In the ocean, ruins ecosystems. And the downstream effects of that affect all of us. And so think about what you're doing in nature. Think about, think of just as you go about your everyday life, what am I doing that affects nature? And what are the downstream effects of that? And then, you know, take that to bigger decisions that you're making when you're thinking about the products you buy, the things you do, et cetera. Who do I want to be when I think about myself in relation to nature? And then the last thing I would think about is read up on biodiversity, right? There is a lot happening right now, which explains why biodiversity is so incredibly important. And so just start to educate yourself on that. Well, great thoughts to end with. Thanks so much, JJ Bramberg. This has been really interesting. So good to talk to you, Lee. Thanks for joining us on the Future X podcast. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, Google, or anywhere fine podcasts appear in your feed. For more info about Future X, visit futurex.studio.